Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Welcome to today's webinar, Practical QI, Tools to Enhance Learning and Improvement, provided through a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative, a program of the Pennsylvania Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. This webinar is the first of two led by Dr. Rutman that aims to obtain a better understanding of how to propose a SMART aim for a quality improvement project and how to determine appropriate measures, including outcome process and balancing, to monitor the impact of interventions and how to analyze outcomes by properly interpreting statistical process control charts. The second webinar will be on September 12th. I, my name is Dr. Renee Turchi, and I'm a pediatrician at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia and medical director of the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative. This webinar is recorded. The recording will be available on both the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative website as well as posted on the University of Pittsburgh Internet-Based Studies and Education and Research, ISER, website. For CME purposes, please be advised that both Dr. Rutman and myself have no disclosures. Please note that the information presented in this webinar is educational in nature and does not necessarily represent the views or policies of the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics or its funders. <clears throat> now, allow me to introduce Dr. Rutman. Dr. Lori Rutman, MD and PH, is an assistant professor of pediatric emergency medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine and attending physician in the emergency department at Seattle Children's Hospital. She completed her medical degree in pediatric residency training at Stanford University prior to moving to Seattle Children's for Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellowship in 2011. Dr. Rutman has an interest in quality improvement research and is a graduate of the Advanced Improvement Methods course at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. She is a physician owner of the hospital-wide septic shock pathway at Seattle Children's and provides medical oversight for Seattle Children's improvement with the National Improving Pediatric Sepsis Outcomes Collaborative. She has published numerous QI studies related to outcomes of the evidence-based care pathways for common pediatric conditions, including asthma, community-acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and acute gastroenteritis. We are delighted to have Dr. Rutman present on this timely and important topic for primary care clinicians. Thank you, Dr. Rutman, for being here with us today, and please begin your presentation. Thanks, Dr. Churchy. It's really an honor to be a part of this um, collaborative, and thanks for the invitation to present for today's webinar. So as mentioned, I'll be presenting on Practical QI, Tools to Enhance Learning and Improvement. The objectives of my talk today are really to review the Model for Improvement, which is a, a framework provided by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, to take a deep dive into Plan, Do, Study, Act cycles, and then to introduce the concept of statistical process control, or SPC. When we talk about SPC, we'll touch a little bit on the theory of variation, what that means, then give some examples of Schuhart or control charts, and specifically cover what they are, how we use them, and importantly, why they're important to use for all quality improvement work. So many talks have the re references and the resources at the end, but I'd like to start with mine here. Um, on the far left of this slide, you see the model for improvement, and it's a really simple framework with three questions kind of sitting on top of a PDSA cycle. I hope by the end of today's webinar, you'll feel a little bit more intimately connected to the model for improvement and also see how it might be applied to some of your, the QI work that you're doing. To the right are shots of the three books that really have informed uh, my future slides and that I find probably the most useful references when thinking about quality improvement work. So I'll highlight them here. The first is the improvement guide, and this is a really great overview. So if, if what you hear today interests you and you want to kind of take a deeper dive, I'd highly recommend the improvement guide as a really basic text on quality improvement concepts. The book there in the middle, the healthcare data guide, is really the Bible for SPC. So if you feel that you know, using control charts or looking at your data and analyzing the data, um, the outcomes of the work that you're doing would be helpful and something you want to take further, the Healthcare Data Guide is really a step-by-step -step guide on how to create, interpret, and choose appropriate SPC charts. And then the final book there, Quality Improvement Through Planned Experimentation, really gives some alternative approaches for ways to analyze QI studies um, and 
can also be extremely um, helpful if kind of traditional measures and traditional ways of approaching QI work are not proving fruitful for your project. So I'm going to jump right in with some fundamental principles for improvement. There are really five key principles for improvement. The first is to know why you need to improve. I think that what happens often with quality improvement work is people are assigned the task of doing this. You know, they're told, do a QI project. It's part of your MOC. It's part of um, the requirements of our clinic. But really, there's no sense in taking on a quality improvement unless there's truly a need for something to improve. Have a feedback mechanism to know if the changes that you're making or the things that you're doing are actually causing changes in the direction that you're hoping for. Develop an effective change, and we'll talk about some strategies for actually applying tools to develop effective changes. Test changes before you attempt to implement them, um, and this really is sort of the, the crux of PDSA cycles, and we'll talk more about that too. And then know when and how to make changes permanent. So really, you can test things on a small scale, but then knowing when to take it to full scale and or to spread it beyond the work that you're doing locally um, is, is really a key principle for improvement. The model for improvement in PDSA cycles are the framework or kind of the, the construct that we use to test, to implement and then test all of those fundamental principles of improvement. So why this model for improvement? The model for improvement is actually really useful for both process and product improvement. It, it was really adapted from industry and then applied to healthcare um, and can be useful for both process and product improvement. It's applicable to all types of organizations, so while we're talking about it here in the context of healthcare improvements, it really can be used across the board. I mean, people have applied this to their own personal improvement goals just in life, um, but it's widely applicable, very broad, and easy to apply. It does facilitate the use of teamwork. It provides a framework for the use of statistical tools, notably SPC, which I mentioned we'll talk about more in just a few moments. Encourages planning to be based on theory. It emphasizes the iterative learning process, so again, emphasizes that you're going to make changes, test changes, review the changes, and then implement a new and improved process. And empowers people in an organization to take action, and really that's by setting clear goals and everyone understanding kind of what their roles are and how they're a part of the improvement effort. So what we'll do over the next several slides is really take a deep dive into each of these questions. As I mentioned, the model is really deceptively simple. It's three simple questions sitting on top of this PDSA cycle, but each question really carries a lot of weight and has sort of deeper meaning. So we'll take a deep dive into each one. I will say here that while the questions are listed in this order and I'm going to be reviewing them in this order, it's not important when you're considering a QI project that you might be working on to take them in this order. They can be considered and taken, you know, in any order that makes sense for the work that you're doing. But we'll jump right into the first question. So the first question of the model for improvement is what are we trying to accomplish? And what that's really getting at is what is our aim? What is it actually that we want to improve? So an aim statement is a really important first step when you're undertaking any kind of QI work. A clearly written aim statement will provide leadership and understanding of your purpose. It does help you know who needs to be a part of your team, so it assists with team selection. It will help reduce variation from the original purpose. So many of us have probably been involved in QI projects or just other work-related projects where you start out with one goal or the, the team is aiming to change one thing, but then as multiple stakeholders become involved, the mission can, can kind of fluctuate and people might have other ideas and other things that are priorities to them that kind of take over the, the purpose of the work. Having a clearly written aim statement will always be able to bring the QI project back to its original purpose. It also, if it's a um, smart aim, will define the magnitude of the expected improvement and set a timeline. And these things are really key. So I mentioned a smart aim. What a smart aim is, is something that is specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time dependent. So you're actually going to have something that you set a timeline, you know how much improvement you're going to expect, and you have a timeline for when you expect that improvement to happen. I'll give an example of that on a future slide. So here's an example of a clearly written aim statement that's very specific. During the next six months, a clinic's practice will be redesigned to obtain a 30% increase, so saying how much you expect to improve in symptom-free days and a 50% reduction in the number of exacerbations reported for a pilot asthma population. At least 90% of patients with asthma will be treated with maintenance meds 
and greater than 80% of patients will have a completed act, written action plan. So again, this is a, a wordy and kind of long um, aim statement, but it does really clearly specify how much and in what direction this team wants to improve their asthma care. A simpler example is here. This team aimed to redesign emergency department processes to increase patient and family satisfaction with their experience in the ED by greater than 30% before June 2010. So with this, you know exactly that this emergency department team, you know what they're trying to improve. They want to increase patient and family satisfaction with their experience in the ED, and by how much, by greater than 30%, and by when, by before June of 2010. So this is a really simple but clear example of how a SMART AIM statement might be structured. As we get into the second question of the model for improvement, how will we know that it changes in improvement? What we're really talking about here are measures. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to select your measures carefully um, and to be thoughtful about them as you set out to do QI work. There are various types of measures, and they've been defined um, in many different ways, actually. If you, if you look through QI literature, people interpret different types of measures differently. Um, but I'll provide these definitions here and kind of give you my um, interpretation of what an outcome process and balancing measure is. So an outcome measure is really the voice of the customer or the patient, and it reflects how the system's performing and what's the result. I like to think about outcome measures as something that a patient, um, mostly in our situation, it's the patient we're talking about, but something that the patient feels for themselves. And so in my world, in the emergency department, a common outcome measure is length of stay, because a patient actually directly feels their length of stay in a, in a clinic or in an emergency department. They feel that they were there for 240 minutes or whatever it might have been. So that time variable of length of stay would be an example of an outcome measure. Another example of an outcome measure might be cost, um, and that's something that a patient um, or the payer feels directly. A process measure, on the other hand, is really the voice of the system at large. And so process measures are things like the percentage of appropriate prophylactic antibiotics selected or the percentage of on-time administration of antibiotics. So it's it's not something that an individual patient will feel, but it's how the whole system is performing. Another example of this might be the percentage of patients that are admitted from your clinic or admitted to the hospital from the emergency department. Each individual patient feels whether or not they're admitted, but they don't really feel what percentage of the whole system is being admitted at that given moment. So it's really the workings of the system. And then balancing measures really can be either outcome or process measures. But what they are are the potential unintended consequences of the changes that you're making. This is one, balancing measures are often neglected um, or they're things that kind of become the Achilles heel of a QI project that you realize are problematic after the fact. But I really encourage um, you when you're taking on new QI work to think about what are the potential unintended consequences of this work right from the start. So these can be things like patient satisfaction or cost. So oftentimes if we're implementing something that's going to be an improvement, there are costs um, and we need to decide if the, the value of the intervention um, is such that it justifies the cost uh, to the patient or to the clinic, et cetera. So balancing measures are really important things to sort of think through as you're planning out your QI uh, work. The third question of the model for improvement is what change can we make that will result in improvement? When we're talking about change, there, um, this is a little bit of semantics, but I think it's important to consider. There are both first order and second order changes. So first order changes are the things that we do every day that are needed just to keep a system performing at its current level. So these are the things, the many adjustments we make to kind of keep things flowing at status quo. Um, for us, as an example in the emergency department would be that, you know, we know that we're going to have in an academic medical center new trainees coming every July. And so perhaps during those times we upstaff with more experienced providers or we have more um, attending physicians or supervisors around, and that's just something that we do every year because it's an expected change. Similarly, during winter months or flu season, we know that we're going to have increased volumes of patients, and that's just something that happens in a seasonal way. And so we'll upstaff or have, um, have more providers available, perhaps have extended hours of urgent care. So these are the changes that are just keeping the system flowing at its um, current level. 
On the other hand, second order changes are the changes that are needed to really improve a system or to create an entirely new system. So these are things beyond those little tweaks that we do all the time just to keep our system performing at status quo. Second order changes are really what's required for most improvement efforts. They usually involve the design or redesign of at least some aspect of a system and will alter how the system works and what people do. I mean, this might be a very simple change in a, in a process, say, to improve clinic flow or um, to get more patients to comply to some new guideline that you're trying to implement, but it really does alter how the system works and what people within it do. Second order changes are developed by critically thinking about the current system, and it's often helpful to really kind of map out what the current state is. So using, you know, various QI tools where you just create a current state map uh, to look to see all the steps, all the constraints, all the um, individual processes that currently go into how your system works. Uh, learning from approaches in other organizations, so if it's something that you're trying to improve that another organization that's similar to yours has done really well, um, it's often helpful to learn from those approaches. Sometimes it means using a new technology, so, you know, thinking outside the box, using, um, using new uh, tablet-based technology, maybe changing from a paper form to an electronic form, things like that that really can um, change the, the way people approach the care that they're providing, and applying cre creative thinking methods to think about those new approaches and apply um, new techniques to really change the way the system's operating. I'm going to use this case study, this example of a morning meeting, to hopefully illustrate some of the, the concepts I've just discussed related to the model for improvement, and also to kind of segue into the discussion about PDSA cycles and how those might be applied to an improvement project. So for this example, we'll talk about a morning meeting where a clinic director feels really frustrated um, because there have been difficulties expressed by his staff regarding their daily morning meeting. So historically, this meeting was a time where uh, the team gathered to discuss anticipated patient or clinic issues for the day uh, and for staff to bring any quality or safety concerns to the director. But over time, the meetings have been running late because there have been multiple staff issues. Some of them are relevant to patient care and others are not. And at the last meeting, a physician just stormed out in the middle saying that we're wasting our time here. Um, why are we even doing this? Here's an image of what you can imagine what that meeting might have been like. And I'm sure many of us have been in meetings like this where we're like, what is the point of this? And this is a waste of my hour. I could have gotten so many other things done. So if we flip back to the model for improvement and that first question, what are we trying to accomplish? I mean, this clinic director clearly has a, uh, something that they'd like to improve, right? Nobody is in the business of trying to waste anybody's time. Um, and so the goal here would be to redesign the morning meeting to be more effective and timely. And if we took that kind of global aim to a more specific aim or a SMART aim, you might say that during the next four weeks, we'll redesign the morning meeting to increase the number of topics covered from a baseline of five and in the meeting within or under the allotted time 80% of the time. So again, this is really specific. Um, it outlines how much improvement is expected from a baseline of five and by what time. So during the next four weeks, they expect that they will make all of these improvements. We go to the second question in the model for improvement, how will we know that the change is an improvement? This is where they had to consider what measures will we follow. So there are easy things that can be measured, right? So you can measure the length of time of each meeting, the number of items or topics that were covered in each meeting, and then on a scale of one to five, and how how is the meeting, a little Likert scale question of, uh, staff satisfaction to get a sense of if the changes that they're making were actually improving the way people felt about uh, the meeting itself. And then what changes can we make that will reser result in improvement? Again, this reflects back to those first order and second order changes and the, the things that we can do to change the process, to change the way people um, act within a system to actually get us to a point of improvement. And so, in this case, attendee, attendees used brainstorming to basically come up with a list of all the ideas that they thought might actually um, result in improvement. I think, you know, brainstorming can be a very effective technique, especially if you need buy-in from um, team members 
to actually engage in a new process. If individuals on the team have felt like they contributed to the ideas that are being tested, they're more likely to um, buy in and to be a part of the change effort. So here there was this whole list of, uh, of different things that could lead to improvement, having fewer people in attendance, meeting less often, using an agenda, um, stop having the meetings all together, limit the time of each meeting or ending the meeting at a certain time no matter what. So you can you can see that and you know some more creative ideas than others, but just getting people to kind of think outside the box and just give all the possible changes that they um, can think about can be a helpful starting point at least when you're thinking about an, an improvement effort. So as I mentioned, we'll now segue into the PDSA cycle. Um, I know that your group has had some introduction to PDSA cycles, and these really are um, critical in any improvement work because what this reflects is that all change is iterative change, and things need to be tested and then re-implemented to really understand that um, the changes that you're making are improvements and that you're not just implementing things and then letting them go, um, whether or not they're making the system better or not. So PDSA cycles are also known as Schuhart cycles, Deming cycles, or the learning and improvement cycle. PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. So the planning phase of a PDSA cycle is really where you um, elicit the questions and make some predictions about what you're trying to um, improve, who's going to be involved, where will these changes take place and when? And it's also where you plan for your measures. So you think about what things do I need to be tracking or collecting in order to determine if these changes are an improvement. The do phase, um, as it insinuates, is where you actually carry out your plan. Um, when you're doing an improvement effort or testing the first round of an improvement effort, it is important to document any problems or unexpected observations. So things that are not going at all as you expected or things that you did not anticipate were going to be problems because those will be really helpful um, bits of information as you think about the next cycle. Um, and in the do phase, you start actually in real time analyzing uh, the data that you're collecting. So this is something that you, you want to be monitoring in a really um, prospective way. So for example, in a morning meeting, if you were really trying to reduce the time that the meeting took or increase the number of topics that were covered, you'd want to be monitoring that week to week and not making huge changes based on you know, small increments of data, but actually just understanding the trend and where things were going is very helpful, rather than looking at it all after the fact. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to really track that data over time and look at it in a prospective way. And then in the study phase, you would actually complete the analysis of the data. So this is where you have a little bit more time and a little bit more perspective on whether or not the changes you made um, were an improvement or whether or not the changes that are taking place are in the um, intended direction. And then the ACT phase is where you decide, you know, was our process great the first time? The changes are all going in the direction that we hoped um, and we feel like we, can, we should really run with this for a while? Or um, did we have some important learnings from the first cycle where we need to act, change our process again, and then run through the whole PDSA cycle over again? So there are some principles for testing a change. Um, the first is to think a couple cycles ahead of the initial test. Scale down and decrease the time required for the initial test. So this is meant to be um, a pretty agile process. So as you're thinking about, you know, what will we be anticipating what we might need to be doing in the future and what the cycles might look like down the line, keeping it small from the start um, is often helpful because if you you know, go into this with some really huge plans for the first cycle, um, chances are your team and sort of your own energy will, will dwindle and you're not going to be able to really uh, sustain this as a, as a continued improvement project. Don't try to get buy-in for the test, so use volunteers. And this is important. I mentioned that, you know, if, if, for example, with the morning meeting case, the team was brainstorming different ideas for improvement, um, there are going to be people who are early adopters in any improvement effort, and getting those folks who seem passionate about changing things to be sort of the first round of testers um, can be really helpful because uh, you don't need you don't want to be trying to solicit buy-in from people who are not early adopters um, at those early stages because it will only impede sort of your ability to really test and cycle through a couple PDSA cycles. Um, it's important to be innovative and make the test 
feasible. So this might be, you know, testing it on a very small scale, like just kind of sketching it out in a tabletop simulation where you're not even actually doing it in a real, uh, say, clinic setting or not in a real meeting setting, but you're just kind of running through different iterations on paper. Um, just anything that, you know, you can do to actually ensure that you're going through multiple iterations of change um, and to make these tests really feasible. So why test? Why not just, you know, have a good idea, have a hunch that something is going to make your process better, implement it and run with it and just let people um, respond as they may. But if you know if you have a good idea, why not just implement? So you test because you can increase the degree of belief that a change is going to lead, lead to improvement. So when, it, when people feel that things have been really tested and um, improved based on whatever problems were uh, elicited during the first couple of cycles, there's more belief that this actually is going to make a difference. And also, if you have data to support that, if you say, like, look, over the first couple of iterations, we really demonstrated that, you know, we were going to decrease the time of the morning meeting or that we were going to be able to cover more topics or end on time, uh, people will be more likely to believe that the, the new process is something that's going to uh, truly make a positive change. It helps you decide which changes will lead to improvement. And so, as I mentioned, as you're going through uh, and tracking your improvement over time, you sort of understand which things that you're doing are actually making a difference. So if you're just changing, say, one or two things with each cycle uh, and then monitoring what direction sort of your, your metrics are going, you understand which of the changes that you're making are actually the things that are, are leading to positive improvements. It also helps you evaluate how much improvement to expect. So often when we set those SMART aims or we write an aim statement from the start, we really think that we're going to um, save the world. We're going to make huge improvements. We're going to get 100% compliance. We're going to you know, make this morning meeting the most valuable part of a person's day. But as you begin to test, you might sort of reconsider what your aim is and reconsider how much improvement you actually will be able to um, achieve. And I think that can be really useful sort of as a, as a reality check. If, if there's not good data from prior studies or from prior efforts to know how much change you should expect, doing some small tests from the start can help you get a sense of how much change is actually really um, feasible and how much is possible. It also allows you to adapt a proposed change to the actual environment. So as you run through things, you might find that, you know, um, the changes that were proposed really would work well in another environment, but that there are certain constraints within your system that are not going to allow them to work that way within your system. And so um, testing on a small scale can help you understand kind of what are the nuances of your system and your environment that are going to allow these changes to be most successful. And then also evaluating the cost implications or side effects of the change. So while we try to think about all those balancing measures from the start, like what are the un unintended consequences of the changes I'm making, um, sometimes they don't show themselves until you're a couple cycles in um, to those initial rounds of testing. And once you kind of understand what are the things that are uh, coming to the surface as problems as I'm trying to implement this change, you know that those are kind of going to be some of your balancing measures that you'll need to track over time. Um, and if you hadn't tested and you hadn't kind of run through this on a small scale, you wouldn't know what those things are until they really become problems. It also allows a team uh, to experience a change prior to fully implementing it. And so you can get really valuable feedback if, um, if the team has experienced it before it just becomes the, the new rule. So we'll now go back to the morning meeting and um, hopefully use this structure to really take a deep dive into a PDSA cycle. Uh, this cartoon here just says, what if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? So hopefully um, after this webinar, we won't be taking that approach. So in PDSA cycle one, again, we start with the planning phase. So the director here um, designed a new meeting process on paper. So again, making it feasible, very small scale, just kind of sketched out what the new meeting process might look like. Uh, and his initial predictions were that he'd have a more effective meeting in half the time um, and sent out this new proposal to the group for comments. Um, it took more than a week to get comments back from everybody, but that was really the do phase of this cycle. So the planning was just him taking all the information from the brainstorming session, sketching it out on paper, sending it out and getting comments back. And then the study phase of this very simple um, PDSA cycle would be for him to review the feedback and concerns from the group and make some changes to his proposal um, for the new meeting process, and then preparing copies to hand out at the next meeting so that they could discuss it further. 
as I've alluded to a couple of times already, you know, this is PDSA cycle one. So um, what happens often in quality improvement work is that we do one cycle like this, and then it's discussed at the meeting, and then it's just, this is it. This is our new process that we're going to implement. But it's really important that the change is iterative and that we run at least a couple of cycles before making a change permanent. So by doing multiple PDSA cycles, looking at data over time, we kind of take it up this ramp from hunches, theories, and ideas into changes that will actually result um, in improvement and hopefully be sustained. <clears throat> so in this example, PDSA cycle two, the new meeting process was reviewed. There was going to be just, it was just going to be three times a week with a pre-submitted agenda. There'd be someone keeping time. Um, there was plans to test for the next meeting, uh, and everyone predicted that the meeting would be shorter. Um, in the due phase of this example, there was only one agenda topic pre-submitted, uh, and the reason was because the group didn't understand actually how to submit topics. So again, this just is an example to say, like, you might elicit problems with your new process if you test it on a small scale. So if a group didn't know how to submit agenda items, then you're not going to submit any agenda items, right? But you wouldn't know that unless you tested it first. Um, so the meeting in this case was very, very short, um, but for the wrong reason. It was just because nobody knew how to actually submit their agenda items, um, and the quality ratings were low. Uh, and so in the ACT phase of this, uh, leading to the next phase of improvement, a staff member designed a standardized form for actually submitting topics for future meetings. And so um, hopefully addressing the issue that was identified in the due phase of this cycle. Again, iterative changes, and we're going to go through another PDSA cycle of this meeting. So in PDSA cycle three, uh, the topics were submitted. The agenda was constructed the day before the meeting. It was distributed in advance so individuals could prepare. Um, they had 15 agenda items covered. Uh, because one topic wasn't covered in the allotted time, they forwarded it to their next meeting per the process that they set up. Um, in the study phase, they'd been unable to cover more than five issues previously, and um, now they were able to cover 15, and quality ratings improved. Uh, and after this phase, this is just the third phase of a PDSA cycle, um, people were ready to commit. They felt like this seemed like it was good enough to move forward with, and they agreed to continuously um, refine the process as necessary if new problems developed. And I think that's a really important point. So uh, even when your team is ready to commit to something new and you're going to roll out an improvement effort, it is important to continue to monitor that data over time. And as things change, as the system changes, as the environment changes, as the workforce changes, to really be monitoring the, the metrics that are important to you to know if you need to, um, down the line, make future changes to really keep, keep your process um, leading to the improvements you were hoping for. So in cycle four, this is where we think about spread. So the, the new meeting process was so successful for this group that it was implemented across multiple subspecialty groups within the medical practice, and plans were made to make the process more sustainable. So this is where they really started looking at run charts um, of the length of time, the number of topics covered, and the quality rating developed and updated uh, at the end of each meeting. They made some changes over the next six months based on the data that they were collecting. Um, and then continued to reap the benefits of the new process. They had a 60% reduction in meeting time and then improved morale among the staff who now have a way to get their issues onto the agenda and to get discussed in a timely manner. So I mentioned here that there were some run charts that this group um, was following. And a run chart is really a very simple line graph that allows you to see uh, your changes over time. I will say that a run chart, um, which you see three examples of here, is different than an SPC chart, which we're going to be um, diving into in the next part of this webinar. A run chart is not a statistical tool, uh, but it is a good quality improvement tool that can help you learn about your process. So you'll notice here there's just a center, kind of a mean line, uh, and then the, the data points are plotted around that line. There are no upper and lower control limits, as we'll talk about when we dive into SPC. But here you can see the first chart here are minutes and the time for the morning meeting, and the group was monitoring them um, with each week, uh, clearly outlined on the x-axis. And then as they saw a shift, uh, a downward shift in the time for the morning meeting, they, their center line shifted down. Um, the number of topics covered at the meeting was also tracked over time, as well as the quality um, rating of the meeting. And so as the group is continuing to roll out their new process and 
if these are the important metrics that they're following, they can continue to, um, to monitor these changes over time and decide if they need to uh, readdress any part of the, the clinic meeting process. So just to reflect on that morning meeting discussion, um, and again, it's a really simple example, but I do hope that it, it shows how you can start with the model for improvement um, and answering those three simple questions to really focus an improvement effort. Um, supporting the change with data, so in this case, it was just simple run charts uh, used in real time to monitor the successes and challenges of the project. Um, to be creative in developing the change, thinking outside the box, polling people, brainstorming with, um, with the group who's going to be uh, in implementing the changes, and then testing the change through multiple PDSA cycles, so taking really small scale changes for cycle one and then ramping up um, to ultimately uh, implementing a new process and potentially even spreading that process um, beyond the, the initial team. And then implement, implementing uh, a change is important in that the, the cycle really focuses on how to make a change permanent. So once something's been implemented and you've done a couple of tweaks over um, the short term, really thinking about how do we uh, embed this process so that even after the initial team perhaps, cycles out or is no longer around, this is just embedded in the culture and it's just a part of the way the system works. If changes are positive, um, it's important that there's a sort of sustainability plan for uh, keeping them going even when uh, the initial stakeholders are no longer a part of it. And then the human side of change is really to engage all those stakeholders early uh, in the process of change so that people uh, feel ownership and feel uh, like they have a voice. Um, in the working of the system and that their, their voice is being heard. So I'm now going to spend a few minutes talking about statistical process control. Um, the, the two men pictured here are really sort of the, the grandfathers of much of the Q, QI concepts I've talked about and also um, specifically Walter Schuhart is sort of the granddaddy of statistical process control. So Schuhart had a theory of variation um, that really focused on two things. One are the common causes of variation, which are the, the changes that are inherent in the system over time that affect everyone working in the system and all outcomes of the system. So the other name for common cause variation um, is like chance cause, or if you have only common cause variation affecting a system, you'd say you have a very stable process. Um, and in SPC talk, you would say that your process is in statistical control. So this is just the, the normal variation. These are kind of seasonal fluxes in patient volumes, or as I mentioned earlier, when you have new trainees coming, that your length of stay for patients might increase because trainees are taking a, um, a little bit more time to see patients. They're the things that you know and you expect and that happen every year, it's like flu season. Whereas special causes are really not a part of the system all the time. Um, they don't necessarily affect everyone, and they arise because of specific circumstances. So other names for this might be an assignable cause. Um, if you have special causes in a system, you might say that um, the system is unstable um, or that the process is not in statistical control. So these are big changes. You know, if, if regular flu season is an example of common cause variation, then you know, having a year where you have H1N1 or you have some really big, um, big flu uh, epidemic would be an example of a special cause. So what is a Schuhart or a control chart? A Schuhart chart is a statistical tool that's used to distinguish between variation in a measure due to common causes versus special causes. So are the changes that we're seeing just part of the normal ebbs and flow, the normal expected variation within a system, or did something really change within the system to um, generate what we would call a special cause? As I alluded to earlier, it includes a center line, like a run chart does, but then there are also these upper and lower control limits, which are called three sigma limits, which might vary um, based on the subgroup size, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit more. And each type of chart has its own formula with statistics that are used to generate that formula. So the first step in developing a Schuhart chart and really in developing any of your measures is to decide what kind of data you're going to be able to collect. Um, as many of you are aware, there's continuous data, which is things like weight, time, money, temperature, length, volume, workload. Um, and then there's classification and count data or attribute data. So the number of defects, the percent, of, you know, the number of admissions versus non-admissions. Um, 
the number of, of accidents or medical errors compared to not. Um, and, and each type of data has its own chart um, to really learn from. This is the um, not meant to be sort of read in detail right now, but just to show that they're, you know, starting with the type of data that you have, whether it's count sort of attribute data or continuous data, you are um, able to choose a chart that is most appropriate for that data type. At the bottom here, you do see that a run chart, um, as we saw with the morning meeting example, can be used with any type of data. Um, it's often the starting point for viewing data over time when a few data are available. Um, and the rules for interpretation of a run chart, which is that simple line graph, are not the same as the rules for interpretation of a Schuhart chart, which is really a statistical tool. So what gives a Schuhart sort of its, a Schuhart chart or an SPC chart its statistical weight are these three sigma control limits that are above and below the center line. Um, these limits are really, Schuhart assigned them, he was a statistician um, who worked for Bell Labs and was really looking at changes in the telephone industry, but he assigned these limits to give a general formula that would um, really define a system so that when you had changes outside of those limits, you knew that it was not something um, that was just part of the inherent workings of the system, but something special was going on. You're, again, not intended to really know this formula, but um, the general limits are, are defined here for the upper and lower control limits. So why use these three sigma limits? Um, as I mentioned, they do have a basis in statistical theory. Um, in most cases, using these limits approximately, it minimizes the cost due to overreaction and underreaction to variations in the process. So um, what these limits do is really allows you to say like, oh, we've had a couple of points, you know, that seem like they're trending up. Well, they may be trending up, but that might be within the normal confines of, of sort of what we expect within this system that trend might not really be something that's statistically meaningful or something that we need to react to. So I think it's, it's important in knowing, you know, when you're actually, um, one, making changes that are really changing the way your system is operating, but two, knowing when you need to react to changes that you're seeing in your data um, on a control chart. The idea for Schuhart was that these limits would protect the morale of workers in the, in the system um, by defining the magnitude of variation that's already been built into the process. So, Again, all systems operate with some degree of variation, and it's just understanding when that variation has hit kind of a critical threshold. So this is what a Schuhart chart looks like. Um, I mentioned that the upper and lower control limits can be um, flat or they can change with the subgroup size, and so the chart at the top here um, shows you a, a Schuhart chart where each of the subgroups, so the ones that are listed along the x-axis, would be of the, of the same size. So in this case, you know, they might have been sampling like 10 cases every month, and every month there were 10 data points that went into generating um, generating their, their numbers, whereas on the bottom um, chart, you see that each subgroup probably has different sizes because the upper and lower control limits are kind of bumpy, um, and so for them, it might have been that each subgroup was, um, was just the patients that came into clinic, and they were not sampling specific numbers. Like, I love the, the pattern, but I have no idea what the change means. Um, and so there are several rules. The first is that if you have a data point that falls outside of the control limits on the chart, either above or below the upper or lower control limit, um, that's a sign that you have special cause variation. So I mentioned that the reason that those control limits exist is to say, like, within these confines, these are the, the normal workings of our system, but if something has happened outside of these, con these um, limits, it's something that's really um, outside of what we would expect for normal change. Um, there's a shift which might be eight or more points above or below the mean or below the, above or below the center line. A trend would be six points going up or down in one direction, and then two out of three points um, in the outer third of the chart is another rule for special cause. Uh, the next slide really just shows that those same rules um, in a in a graphical sort of visual format for those who are more visual learners and also to show you what, what they look like on the chart. Um, the next slide talks about how to use Schuhart charts, and I, I did sort of allude to this earlier. Um, these charts can be used in both a passive or an active way, and what that means is you might be using it as you're kind of, you've started an improvement project and you're looking at your data prospectively over time um, and then watching to see, you know, after you've made an improvement, did you cause 
special cause variation within your system? Did you actually change the system, um, hopefully in the direction you were intending, to shift things to a new normal? Um, but they also can be used, so that would be sort of the active approach, like you're, you're prospectively using the chart in an active way and seeing if the changes that you've implemented have actually changed the system. The more passive way is if you, say, have a system where changes have been, many changes have been made over time and you want to understand um, if any of those things, those events, actually um, led to special cause. And so you might march, like, lay out all your data in a more retrospective fashion, like I want to look at my clinic's data for the past five years, um, annotating the chart with all things that happened over those past five years and understanding if there were special causes related to the things that happened kind of in the past. So they can be used in both directions. Um, the next graphic there really just outlines the passive and active use of Schuhart charts, probably easier to read if you um, print it out. Um, and then finally, why use these charts? And so um, this becomes relevant really when you're thinking about, you know, is this QI work going to become academic work? Do I need this to be statistically um, rigorous? But also I think it's really important just for um, as you're engaging stakeholders and sort of engaging leadership in the quality improvement work you want to do, it's easy to say that before and after a change, if you sort of look at like a mean of something, the average of something before and the average of something after, and assign like a, a p-value to say like, look, our change was significant. We had, you know, a four-hour average morning meeting before and then a two-hour average meeting at time afterwards, and so we definitely made an improvement. But that same before and after could look very different if you looked at the data kind of spread out over time um, because the trends in the data may be very different. And it is possible what the, the slide um, with the multiple charts on it is showing you that is that it is definitely possible that the changes you made were not at all related to the improvements that you saw. Um, but if you're looking at the data in a time series kind of fashion, you can see uh, the temporal relationship between your changes and the improvements. And so the final slide is really my summary to say that um, hopefully I've convinced you that the model for improvement is a simple and powerful tool that can be used to accelerate improvement. Um, again, it's sort of based on setting aims, which is that first question, establishing the measures, which is the second question in the model, and then selecting what changes you're going to um, test. And then testing those changes happens through PDSA cycles. Um, it allows that they allow us to test changes in a really iterative way, learning from data along the way um, from one cycle to the next. And finally, just a, a brief intro to statistical process control. I could do many, many more hours on SPC in and of itself, but SPC charts can be really useful tools for really understanding the impact of improvement efforts um, over time and making sure that we're responding to changes that are, um, that are really going to make improvements in our system. So I will stop there. Um, I don't know if I'm able to see questions or if maybe Renee or Eileen, you're yeah, able to... Yeah, I think um, if we can unmute, well, the, unmute the participant lines, um, and then we can um, maybe have people ask questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, actually, okay. it looks like the slides are advancing right now, so I don't know if maybe people can type in. If they can't, maybe um, our operator can unmute the line for us. Does anyone have any questions um, for Dr. Rutman? If you'd like to ask an audio question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Again, to ask an audio question, press star 1. And at the current time, there are no questions from the audio lines. So I see a, a question that came up in the Q&A box, which is what program can I use to make SPC charts? Um, and so there are several uh, products sort of available. Uh, what I use and what I find the most simple is just an Excel add-on um, that can be used. It's called QI Charts, um, and it's, it's just a, an add-on that gets put into, you know, Microsoft Excel so that if data is being collected and kind of monitored in Excel, um, the program itself will help you select the right chart, and then it actually calculates the control limits for you so that you don't have to really apply any, um, any hard math. The important part on the user end is just knowing uh, how to interpret the chart and when to, to make changes to, to the chart. Uh, and then another question that came through here is, is a balancing measure considered an outcome or a processing measure? And again, balancing measures really can be either. Uh, a balancing measure is really important to consider as um, potential unintended consequences of the changes that you're making. Um, but those consequences could be outcome measures like cost or time. Um, or they may be process measures like maybe you're now uh, admitting too many patients to the hospital or um, 
you've changed your system in a way so it's a process measure. Hi, Dr. Robin. I was wondering, what are the most common types of statistical process control charts used in healthcare QI, and how long after my intervention do I need before identifying changes on these charts? Yeah, so um, probably the most common STC charts are um, ones that look at continuous variables like um, time or cost. Uh, and those are called X-bar and S-charts. So an X-bar chart will show you averages over time, um, and then the S part of it is the um, shows you standard deviations around those averages. So it allows you to really understand the the variability uh, within the system and how the system. If you if you've made a change and things have become less variable, you'll see that on the S-chart. And then the other really common type of chart is a um, P-chart, which is a proportions chart. So that would be for things like percentage of patients who um, are receiving their appropriate controller meds or the percentage of patients who are um, compliant with a new process, um, percentage of patients admitted, things like that. In terms of how much time you need, um, you know, in an, in an ideal world, you would have approximately 8 to 12 data points before you implemented a change and then 8 to 12 data points after you implemented a change. But that doesn't necessarily mean that each data has to be a month. I mean, that could be 8 to 12 clinic days. It could be 8 to 12 weeks. It just sort of depends on um, how many uh, events you have within each, within each subgroup. And I see a couple. One that says, I'm not sure I fully get Shuhart. Any, any place to go for further examples or explanations? So um, yes, definitely. The, um, the book that would be kind of the, the Bible for Shuhart charts and for really understanding what these charts mean would be the Healthcare Data Guide, um, and that's, you know, available. It's the middle book there that's kind of a blue top and um, yellow bottom. So that book is uh, a really clear guide to all of SPC and Shuhart charts if you're interested in learning more about that. The other place to go would be the, the IHI Open School. So if you go onto the Institute for Healthcare Improvement website, their Open School um, has several kind of brief lectures um, on a lot of these topics, and they have a couple that are uh, focused on um, process control that can be really helpful. And then um, I have another question here that says, could you please repeat the name of the Excel add-on program? And so that Excel program is just called QI Charts. Um, not a super creative name, but <laughs> it's called the QI Charts Add-on for Excel. For those who use other statistical programs, you can make control charts in things like Stata um, and some of the more kind of common software, uh, statistical software packages. Um, but QI Charts just does SPC charts and allows you to do it directly from Excel, which for most people who um, are collecting uh, data is a really easy way to, to make the charts quickly. Okay, great, and we're just about at the top of the hour, so um, in the interest of time, maybe we can um, we can stop the, the, the Q&A, and um, if folks have questions, they certainly could email um, Eileen Thompson and uh, Dr. Rutman, we can get those questions to you if you'd be willing to answer them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so at this time, um, this concludes our webinar, so I want to thank Dr. Rutman for her excellent presentation. It was really informative. And many thanks to the Pennsylvania Department of Health for funding that made this webinar possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutman. That was excellent. Thank you.